ഫസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് ഓൾ സിസ്റ്റേഴ്സ് ആൻഡ് ബ്രദേഴ്സ് തമ്മ ഫ്രണ്ട്സ് ആസ് യൂഷ്വൽ വി ആർ ഗോയിങ് ടു സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ദ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ആൻഡ് ആൻസർ സെഷൻ വിൽ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് വിത്ത് ദ റിട്ടൺ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻസ് വി ഇൻവൈറ്റ് വിൻസൺ ടു പ്രസൻറ്റ് ദി ഓൾറെഡി റിട്ടൺ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻസ് ടു സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ദ സെഷൻ പ്ലീസ് Bhante, why alternating sitting and walking meditation in one hour span? Is it for the beginner stage or for all stages of practice? Well, this is for anyone. Um, there is no hard and fast rule. It is to be only one hour or so. Whenever you feel like continuing longer sittings, uh you can adjust accordingly being being this is a 10 day retreat we are going for this standard and even in uh, one or two months according to my understanding in the normal routine we take normal time table we take but uh, if you need any exception you can try it but uh, this this work with nicely one hour alternate sitting Dear Bhante, thank you so much for training us on this retreat. My question, during meditation, the time disappearing, the feeling of breath and then body, it experiences like freezing the body and feels very cold condition, even wearing socks. It feels like I am on ice floor, an ice floor. what happens in the body to get this kind of experience is the blood concentrate to the heart and less blood on peripheral veins please explain thank you bhante with metta uh, that is uh, generally it says that whenever you are excited when you are fearful your epidermis the skin become very uh, warm with full of blood circulation but when and where the concentration and uh, one pointness have pointedness happen it is uh, reduced to the central nervous system and the peripheries are uh, with very minimum amount of blood circulation uh, that we can experience if you are mm, meditating in the places where you have mosquitoes early part of the sitting mosquitoes come and disturb and sometimes if it is so you can go into a deeper concentrated level but once you go on there you can feel mosquitoes are coming and searching about but uh, no blood and they go back sandan they pierce two three places that uh, unsuccessful effort and they go back if you get excited then mosquitoes get blood <laughs> because your your skin become again with the full blood circulation so it appear like the blood circulation also have some patterns when you are excited when you are mm, full of fear uncertainty your outermost skin or the peripheral the epidermis is getting enough blood and uh, maybe at that time central nervous system and others are suffering but when the concentration happens the other way uh, you know, everything becomes centralized like bhante thank you for taking my question many women especially mothers have mastered the art of multitasking we can drink our tea as we make breakfast eat our breakfast while we make the children's lunches still get them all ready to catch the bus before we go to work after the various tasks at work meetings etc home again for dinner preparation activities and bedtime routine in addition to setting aside time for walking and sitting meditation how do we keep our mindfulness in our busy lives not for for a beginner it is not been recommended for the beginner best thing is to have a good start in a retreat like this where the laboratory atmosphere is there somewhat 
uh, you can control the variables and start mindfulness. And in the walking meditation, little bit of challenges. And in the day-to-day -day activities, even within the retreat atmosphere, more challenges. And likewise, it is slowly, slowly, it has to go on multi multitasking or diversification. Even this uh, housewife or this multitasking mother, whenever she is starting, she starts with one thing at a time like jobs and then adding one after the other and ultimately come up to that kind of a highly multitasking thing. So therefore, till you get develop the acquaintance, till you develop the uh, familiarity, you add little by little and there's no end. Skip on, you can add on. So therefore, at the beginning, you have to be very patient. The start is painfully slow, and once started, the sky is the limit. So you can keep on doing, so therefore, be patient at the beginning, and uh, it is not your personal agenda, but it's the way the mindfulness is working. It's pierced into the body with a tiny little hole, and take take over the entirety of the body uh, like the, that is the way it is happening so therefore when you are introducing you have to be give the maximum nursery conditions so conducive conditions and let the mindfulness to uh, catch the momentum you won't believe its limits it is such a capacity we never know about what is the humanity is, how much capable, how much potential, how much possibility is there. The possibility wise, the capability wise, we all are the same. But the only thing is, we have self hate. We don't believe ourselves. We think Michael Jackson is better than me, or the other person is better than me. So, so and that is the only blocking. Otherwise, each and every hero in the in the society, they started with very tiny thing and keep on uh, breaking through these challenges. So therefore, this letter would have written by a lady, and that is how I can explain. So, <laughs> males are not appreciating that ladies work. <laughs> so they are because they they think they are the better type. So this must be coming from that side. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you won't believe my mother had 11 children. No washing machine, no fireplace, nothing. One day when well, Dhammika went to the kitchen and mother was making a cup of tea, she asked, just a fireplace, this is a happy mother, and where is your dishwasher? Where is your washing machine? Well, it's, it's, I think everything is with early get up and till late night she works. And whatever we ask, she can prepare any food or anything. Don't believe such a wife, such a mother. So now I challenge you, each and everyone, you can't. <laughs> you can't. You need so much of utility utensils and luxuries and machines and everything and uh, you have to, have to go and see how they are performing I am so proud but anyway I decided not to marry <laughs> <laughs> you see both the sides I am well at the full in advantages okay we'll go to the next question <laughs> Dear Bhante, being prepared before the unpleasant feeling arises is difficult. You realize the feeling is already there before you realize it. There are a group of yogis constantly talking. First day I not noticed it, ignored it, then every day I see it, hear it. It is not painful feeling but a very unpleasant feeling. I try to be mindful about it and try to apply the Vedana Nupassana on my part. But should I also say something to these people who are constantly talking? This is the difference between Pamada and Apamada. Apamada is the, the key term, it's the synonym for mindfulness. 
the last advice of the Buddha to the, the gathering was Appamade Nabikave Sampadetha Vaidamma Sankhara O monk, diligently fulfill your tasks. So that means when and where the unpleasant feeling arises, without a delay, if you can be aware, there should have so much of preparedness and sensitivity. So you have to understand, at the beginning we don't have both. But that is our task. Go prepared and see by the time you see it, it's already started. So that must be a precursor for next day or next time to catch it one split second more earlier. One split second. Likewise, it is regression going back to the source and it's, it's an enormous journey. So therefore, the person is writing this is really in the battlefield. This is the only way available to understand unpleasant feeling is abundant in our life. But we can't go into its source because of a negligent or delay. So our task, our challenge is not to completely cut through and go to the bare minimum at the one or zero level, no. If you catch it at the 33 level percentage, the next day you have to go and 32 percent, 31 percent, 30 percent like going backward. This is going towards, the, going to the beginning of the humanity, of evolution. We are learning the whole human history. The information is available, but if you get delayed, you may catch it at the later stage. Then it's very complicated. So you have to go back more and more. You go there, task become direct, straightforward, and only with your trial and error experience of the past, only you can go there. So you have to appreciate your own trial and error. And that is indispensable. But we consider our trial and error as a mistake or disheartening or regretting. That is the curse. That's I call lack of sadha, lack of faith, lack of confidence. So therefore, based upon your own experience and you are, anyway you are on the way back home, Go enthusiastically, go energetically, go prepared, and this is the only way available. Dear Bhante, thank you for your insightfulness. My question is about self-doubt. As I tried to focus on the current moment, sometimes these questions came up and struck me and made me doubt myself. The questions are like, who is the one, though, who is the one having those thoughts now. Who is the one breathing? I used to have those confused moments more than 10 years ago when I was 13 or 14 years old. Now it is coming back. Please instruct as I want to know how to face the self-doubt and feeling of emptiness. Thank you so much. So that is the, the, that I was explaining in the early answer also. We have a whole potential have all the capability and the facilities, but nothing blocks other than our doubts. So one example the Buddha given was, uh, if uh, one person is stuck with a poisonous arrow and uh, benevolent people get together and uh, hold the person and try to remove the arrow quickly because it is more is intact, it uh, infuse poison to the blood. So that particular person says, don't touch. I must know who should shoot me. Is a high caste person or low caste person? Is coming from the arrow, is coming from the west side or east side? Without knowing the person who shot at me and his background, don't remove the arrow like. That is what our uh, rational mind is. Then the Buddha says, you have to shut the fellow up and remove the arrow, because as far as the arrow is there, you are tortured. So there, there is no doubt. That is, we call the rational mind. It finds so much of inner chatter fabrication, and sometimes we consider this as the knowledge, this is the perversion. Vichikicca mukhi, jnana mukhi, vichikicca vancheti. 
which is which is the doubt, it appears like a wisdom, it appears like a rational mind, it appears like a, uh, the balancing the pros and cons like, by which utter waste of, wastage of time make you eccentric. So the faith, on the other hand, you just be mindful. And once you develop a certain amount of mindfulness, that your self-doubt and others will be slowly, slowly removed, but never you can remove it by arguing, reasoning. At a start samya and continue, after a while only, you can do away with. So therefore this is, it's a kind of a, a complicated situation the deductive thinking and rational thinking can't give an answer. You have to some or the other start the work and while the mindfulness is continuing, more the thought moment of mindfulness is increasing, less and less will be the self-doubt and it will be such a relief and then only you will appreciate your humanness, what a blessing to be a human and what a blessing to be in the present moment that is Kshana Sampatti, be here and now. So all these, our rational thinking is appear like very reasonable, very scientific, but you have to ask, is it for my well-being? Is it compassionate to me? Or it's or otherwise uh, reasoning for the sake of reasoning? So that, that is the way we have to think and start uh, try to be here and now, try to be mindful. And uh, Vichikicha is one of the fetters uh, you can get rid of by attaining the first Magapala. Uh, till that, uh, we are sleeping with it, we are eat with it, we get up with it, and we work with it. That's why we don't have self contentment or peace of mind of this doubt. So, therefore, don't entertain it or don't let it play in the perverted way. When and where the doubt happens, not it as a doubt. Dear Bhante, thank you so much for your teachings. Buddha said, highest form of giving is Dhammadana. I thank you. My question is letting go or non-attachment. I think as a lay person, I am supposed to balance life. In other words, though I have all reasons to enjoy life for what it is, I enjoy everything in, the mod in moderation. Please tell me if there is a way for me to give up entirely without becoming a nun or a monk. How do I let go things, people so dear to me, uh, things, people so dear to me, without hurting myself and others? How do I create a perfect balance? Is there a Buddhist story, are there Buddhist stories in Jataka stories, etc., where Buddha in previous lifetimes learned to balance life and living it in moderation? Please give me Buddhist examples. Thank you. Well, that is to say, we have to appreciate we are good. But when we are looking at the world with this good eye, we can see better options. So, at the sight of the better option, this says, I can't give up good. That's our curse. Anyway, you have the better, if you can't give up the good, your goodness is your limitation. So this is natural formula. So therefore, when and where you find a better option, see the opportunity and go for the better so that you have to forego good. So the world has understand it because you are not reacting, you are not rejecting anything, you are going for the good to better. So even in our spiritual life, daily we come across, come across so much of opportunities for a better one. So whenever it is happening, uh, you have to get the chance. It is called a blink. If you read uh, Michael Gladwell, the book called The Blink, he says, if you select at that particular moment, you get the benefits. Otherwise, it is gone forever. The opportunity will may not come again. So therefore, whenever you have the better, you have to forego the good. Yet another one is, if you are climbing on ladder, if you have to give up the lower rod, how do you call it? Ran. Run. 
You have to catch hold the upper rung. So therefore, if you wish, wish to get rid of something, catch hold into a better one. Otherwise, you can't give up. So always you have to hold something, then only you can let go. There's no let go is on purpose or the hundred percent. You have to catch hold something, a better one. By, by catching hold, definitely something is letting go. So you take the example of uh, climbing a ladder. Always you take the, uh, the upper run. Then only you can lower, let go the lower part. So therefore, if you wish to give up, learn the art of grabbing. Dear Bhante, thank you very much for your valuable time to come to here all the way from Sri Lanka and giving us this opportunity. Bhante, it is so hard to be mindful all the time. But that's the only way to get concentration too. Am I right? But it takes time. That is, it takes time to empty the mind which gives the best to myself and the world. So, is it okay to practice loving-kindness meditation in the meanwhile, after going home when practicing at home? If so, could you please explain about it too? I thought by doing the loving kind of loving kindness meditation, we can accumulate many merits and which would help to practice mindfulness as well. Please help me to clarify this Bhante. Thank you for your answers and patience. The very first statement, very first sentence is wrong. That means you can't. You must never aim to be hundred percent mindful throughout. You must try to be mindful more than yesterday. One step ahead. And then you will be daily progressing and going. So our mind, whenever it is uh, finding excuses, it is, I cannot be absolutely good. I cannot be uh, completely mindful. Yes, you can. It is not the task. The, the one example we can uh, take it from is that during the time of the Buddha, there was a royal uh, doctor, uh, herbal medicine practitioner called Jivaka. He once went to the, the say, university or the professor and he was the master for the moment in the subject. So he asked him to take that particular plant and study about the quality of its flower, bark, root, leaves and uh, all the five aspects, and uh, write some notes. And once that is finished, he's asking another suitable medicinal plant and study about the five ingredients. And while keeping, he was so day by day, he's learning uh, plant by plant. And after so much of time, after finishing the course, he sent for his project. Project is go into the forest and find a plant which has no medicinal value. So after seven days time, he came back told, I can't, I can find nothing because all the plants are herbal. That is, he is completely mastered. Everything is valuable. So likewise, you start with the most prominent point, conspicuous point, and go by day by day, ultimately you may find a day you clearly know, clearly aware, I am not mindful. That is your uh, highest point. I will ask the question like this. When you try to be mindful on the breath, you know now I am on the breath, here now I am. That's also kind of mindfulness. And while it is happening, maybe after a long time, with full of your self-confidence, one day you know I'm supposed to be here in the breath. But the sound came, definitely I know I am not in the breath. I am in the sound. And that is also a kind of mindfulness. Out of these two situations, which mindfulness is efficient, more skillful, knowing your primary object and be mindful there, or knowing you are not in the primary object and knowing there, 
out of these two, which one is more efficient, which, does, which one is more proficient, which one is more skillful? Any answer? Second. Second. So that is the day you understand perfectly you are mindful 100%. Because you know you are not mindful, but it is not a crime. It's a knowledge. And once you say, yes, I am not mindful, who the hell going to find fault with you? No. Understanding mindfulness only, you understand unmindfulness. And that is the point where you understand the some kind of a total feature, figure of our mind. So therefore, don't be, be regretful. Don't consider it as a mistake. Don't consider it as something negative, nihilistic. Whenever you find unmindfulness, you to understand the day you face or the day you met up with unmindful, still unregrettable, regrettable, unmoved. That's called the power of mindfulness. Pamade na kampati iti satibalang. That's the way when Balsariputta is defining it. You know you are in a lapse. You are in a not mindful but unshaken. And that is the, what you call power of mindfulness. That's a kind of a feasible task, kind of achievable task. And there you can understand whenever you are mindful, you know. Whenever you are naive, not mind, still you know. And that second part is the most radical, most irrational, and that is the way you become sympathetic joy about yourself. I am not perfect, but I know how much I am wrong. When I am wrong, oh, that is a, that's a kind of uh, completion of the knowledge. So therefore have that kind of practical aim, then you can hit the target, task, hit the target. Dear Ba. Dear Bhante, thank you for your patience for answering my question. My question, during the meditation I felt the freezing of the mind. That means it feels like stopping the time or break on the go cycle. Didn't feel any thoughts or pictures come to my mind. One hour meditation was like hundred years with so much boring. No more going feeling but after the meditation, I felt okay, but slow on mind. Am I on the wrong track of meditation? Thank you, Bhante. So, when and where you feel it, can you say it is my mind? No. That's a universal mind you just merge into. You can't claim this as my mind. So that's the way you uh, dissolve into... That's, it's called oceanic feeling. Oceanic means you, you are, if you are a river, you empty into the ocean, no more identity. You dissolve into the ocean like it is the oceanic. So it is beyond time and therefore you can understand uh, how long it was. Before and after the time is there, space is there, but when your mind goes to more and more to the Emptiness, boundaries are no more. Space and time dimension become dissolved. And easily you can understand that state you can experience, but you can't hardly, you can claim this as mine. Because your, your identity, your self-centered thinking and your conceit and your grabbing idea as diluted as possible. So more and more you go there and coming back, go there and coming back, that's the way you season, you become an amphibian. You can live in the water as well as in the, the dry land like. So it's a, it's a, you are not limited to either dry land or the water. You can jump and, uh, you know, Ted Poles, the, the, the gimba. Tadpole. Tadpole. So when they start, they put eggs and with the egg hatch, you get a fish-like creature. It's a totally water animal. And they are looking towards the mother. And mother also sometimes in the water. And occasionally, they find mother is missing. So they feel fearful. Whenever the mother come, go, come to the water, 
they used to go and ask Mother, where were you? She would say, I have gone to the dry land. And the tadpole says, what are you talking about? If you go to the dry land, we'll die. No. So she, Mother is in a hell of a fix, how to explain. So when the tadpole is growing, the internal lungs comes and external, this thing disappears and the legs are coming, tail is sucked into. Ultimately, when the tadpole comes into being, it becomes the amphibian. Can go into the dry land as well as they are. Like you can go to the material world and the immaterial world. The material world is known as this akasa, as emptiness or the space. So whenever you go to the space, no, no, no time, space dimension. And the time dimension is over there. So you have nothing to die or nothing to uh, end your life. But by, as, uh, while you are living, you can go there and come back. So imagine your time in that space is more than 50% of your time. Then what will be your mentality? What kind of a mind state it will be? And imagine that is your real home. As far as you are connected to the senses, you are torturing. You are burning. You are in a strange land. You are creating frustration. When you go, there are no friction. It's a comfort zone. But now we are so misled. We consider that is as something strange and this is as normal. Imagine when you go back home and when you understand that is my real home, so what we have earned as our properties or our belongings are the real thing torturing us. More you earn, more you have to maintain them. You don't know, you never know the limit, the utility value. You keep on earning, 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 so much so you have no time to go to the spaceness or kind, kind of thing. Even if you go there, you feel alienated. And the day you understand that is the aloneness, that is the highest uh, well-being we can do, that is change. That changing is what we call that transcendenting. Transcend, transcendenting into that, it is not a separate world, but by mindfulness and the concentration, you can go there, so develop as much as possible. Don't try to fill it with loving kindness or this. This is under this particular circumstance called escapism. Your mind come out with brilliant ideas. Mind come out with a lot of opinions. They appear very, very compassionate like, but you missed the bus. You have to be unmindful. So therefore, I would say, Mindfulness is, is a totality. It carries loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and the equanimity when it is growing. So therefore, that simple unity or unifying theory is the mindfulness. Please continue, and then uh, you will gain this compassion and other thing as a byproduct, and still you may be mindful. Venerable Bhante, you told us not to manipulate the object during meditation. But last time, I felt low in spirits and cold feeling. I actually looked for the light and bathed myself in light and made me feel better. Is it okay? What harm will it be? Thank you, Bhante. So it's, uh, it's called Aloka Sanya. Whenever you become slimy, lethargic, and sloth and over, it says, look at the rising sun with your closed eyes so you can see the glare. And uh, oh, otherwise, any kind of a light perception you, mel you experience in meditation, both of will help you to uh, develop the energy aspect of. So that is also it is uh, making use of the situation in order to go into the mindfulness and therefore it is not a kind of a manipulation, it is a tool you are using 
to go into the unmanipulated situation. This tool is using in order to go into the uh, unmanipulated situation. So this kind of a valid technique the Buddha recommended specifically for this slimy mind situation. Venerable Bhante, this is the time I wish we had a private session. So I don't embarrass myself, but we don't. I thought I had a break point when I saw and felt, I may be wrong, that I am the bag full of beans. Since then, I could not taste food. All my senses are enhanced, but cannot taste the flavor. No enjoyment, no feeling of stomach or hungry. Thinking that having two meals a day, full vegetarian, I deserve to be having some happiness of good food. In desperation, I meditate on it. Making a long story short, I thought, came up and asked King, which part of you wants the satisfaction of the pleasure of food? of eating the pleasure of food. Then I got dizzy. Three days ago that I saw there was no me and still I am going back to usual self of me. Then I thought one of the movies I watched a long time ago, ignorance is a bliss. bliss. I grow, I know it is a delusion but I want to think I am eating a steak. I am? Steel. I am? Steak. Steak, yeah. Like beef steak. Oh. Is it? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Make me a movie star. <laughs> uh, how many hurdles do I have to go through? Thank you very much, Bhante. So this is a, it's a, it's a attitude to the food. Uh, it is one-fourth of our... Uh, meditation, there are four kinds of food, which is the first time, first kind that is chewable part. The Mahasi Shado, the Burmese Shado, he says that uh, when, you are, when you are practicing specifically long retreats and the elderly generation often get into this kind of a situation. They eat very slowly, noting chewing, chewing, tasting, tasting, swallowing, swallowing, and very easily they feel enough. Ultimately, they won't go, they won't, they won't get the enough food. Few days time, they become weak. And they think they are advanced in meditation, but ultimately what happens is, there is not enough energy. So therefore, Masi said was this, it never happened that this kind of attitude changes happen. Have to have your normal meal. Have to have your normal sleep, have to have your normal bathing, and give this machine, the body, the normal service. Otherwise, it won't perform like that. So there is uh, this kind of thing can happen, not only for the food, uh, the visual objects, sounds, smell, other tactile sensation and thing. So it's happening. You get a uh, new areas, uh, novelty. When it's happening, don't take it as a hindrance, take it as another option, another window opening, and again you can come back to the normal, and again go there. The repetitive application is the only way, only one shot, it won't make much of a lasting difference. When it is happening again and again, it is called anupasana, a repetitive observation that anupasana is a related term to vipassana. Vipassana also you are repetitively apply it and by doing only there's a hardening of the experience, seasoning of the experience can happen. The very first time it is happening, it is very novelty. So that's the time if you are surrounded by other meditative people, if you are in a meditation center, if you have a di question and answers or dialogue, it will be very easier, familiar. Otherwise, you, if you are the only person doing, uh, you may run panic. So that means you are progressing. Your attitudes are changing towards the external thing 
and uh, let it happen again and again. So you, are fac you must be facilitating the repetitive application. Then only it's a hardening and mastering of the same thing can happen. So it's a possible thing. Venerable Bhante, thank you so much for bringing alive the teachings of mindfulness. Thank you, Chuan Ying Monastery and the staff for the ideal environment to practice mindfulness. With gratitude, gratitude, mindful one. He's leaving today, I suppose. And there are two questions, uh, Bhante, I have set aside. Both are asking about information, about suttas and stories and... Uh, if you have, if you, you can, you can handle it. Yeah. Okay. The, the one is asking about the Tibetan death uh, the funeral practices, and all that. I would like, if you don't, may, you may, if you are not aware, I can introduce you to a wonderful website called Google Saffron. Maybe you know that. Google Saffron. S A F F R O N. It, which is a Theravada, Theravada search engine. You type anything, you get loads and loads of stuff on it, the names of suttas, books, uh, fora, and uh, what not. You get thousands of links. You just type the word that you want to look for, uh, or the name of the sutta. It's called Google. Uh, type on Google, Google Saffron, S A F F. R O N, just that. Oh yeah, I actually just got that information from uh, Vincent. It's like uh, uh, Google uh, Maps, uh, Google Drive. It, it's called uh, Google Suffering. So if you uh, punch in uh, Google Suffering on Google, then uh, you will find it. And there you can do your search instead of searching directly on Google.com. <laughs> Okay, 15 minutes more for if there are any questions to the audience, please. Uh, hello, Bante. Uh, I have a question regarding, referring to the first question about the body temperature when doing meditation. When I meditate, I feel very warm. And even like I, I do ice climbing. And then like in order to do ice climbing, I have to walk in snow mountain, go to the ice cliff. And then when I felt so cold, I start meditate, and then my body feel warm, and then that sustain me to do ice climbing. So which is opposite to you say on the first question? Does it mean that I'm not mindful enough? <clears throat> I will give an example to see what is your real point. Uh, when the first time uh, I miss scientists went to Tibetan, they asked His Holiness Dalai Lama to give uh, good meditators to put them into the functional MRI scan and Dalai Lama, I hope, gave 12 people and he went, the, the team went with the gadgets and to the, their own hermits and no one allowed to uh, do the experiment, so they failure. Next time, Dalai Lama requested, they gave three people, they are doing so-called tumbo bhavana, tumbo meditation. That means they can sit on ice and overnight uh, they can make the about six, uh, six foot like of a pool of water boiling around him. It is the body heat. Or naked, if they can cover with the blanket soaked in the ice water and put it there, they can dry the blanket, three blankets, overnight. Yes. So that is the way it is uh, maybe arousing the heat element. So oh. you are arousing the cool element. Am I correct? Is, you mean, is, is it good or bad? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because like from the, your, first, uh, your answer to the first question, it seems like I'm wrong because I no. suppose I should feel cold? No, no there's no such a, such a set formula. <coughs> when you are meditating, you are taken to an unknown area. That's the point where your faith is being tested. If you are going to rationalize it, definitely you will come back and you will cut off your progress. So meditation always takes you to an unknown area. 
we have a neophobia we we are afraid of unknown so they are who we are self uh, how do you call restricted so there are some people risk lovers ready to go to the unknown yeah and they are the lot good for vipassana so i i put it in a very i can ask you for questions like i see the females are not happy with new areas and males are very aggressive when they can do so so whenever i make the females are fighting 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 with me one day that 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 mean that females can't go to nibbana <laughs> <laughs> no i am telling even within the female there are some feminine characteristics but they are bold enough they are ready to take a challenge they to take a risk risk lovers and among the males also there are female like people yeah that is not so when i go to amaravati they told don't use the male female use the term femininity and masculinity oh so this one is the yonso manasikara is masculinity yonso manasikara the wise reflection you are ready to take a risk at the cost of your life and the body so whenever you when a new thing happen if you have a enormous love to your body as well as the life mm-hmm. you will never take the challenge instead you come back and think about the well being of the body and the life so yes. that means you are <clears throat> foregoing that chance the blink the gist so and uh, question is can the mindfulness develop that kind of a character that kind of a la- risk loving character <coughs> the richard davidson <coughs> in his emotional life of brain he says the mindfulness being so freely given in the world and it being the panacea for all the questions we can see how many little fraction of people ready to take it he says he can't even design a research because it is such a thing we don't know whether it is can we can train by we can in, introduce that character by training or it's a genetic or in karmic force so whatever may be when we person as introduce it will be very very appealing for the risk lovers other people find it difficult that it's not his or her own mistake it's a genetical configuration they are very conservative they don't like so they come back to their known background rather than go for so there is a book by eric from fear of freedom or neophobia or there's another term they say is that we we are quite afraid of going to new areas and therefore we always come back to the our conventional situation and we find the truth and there's a there's a <coughs> parable or a joke i don't know whether you have heard about nasruddin nasruddin is a, it's a arabic kind of a person he is a wise person go to the cabinet as a less commoner living with the people also but people love him he is a good joker one day in the at the at uh, the dusk he was searching under a street light and very very seriously so a friend came and asked mulla nasrin what are you searching about he told that my key uh, then he also joined and another person came he also joined and each and every blade of grass they check it but it is not there but nasrin is very seriously searching the other person asked but is it a single key or bunch it is bunch it's a black or white it's a black ultimately where did you lost it i lost it at my room <laughs> <coughs> then everyone is then that you see now it's a, a, a hell of a dark and we are searching here why because here only we have light <laughs> your truth is in the darkness at your room you are searching here so we human beings are real jokers <laughs> we are chasing behind the pleasure principle 
but the truth is lying in the no play, no pleasure situation. And we get together and we are searching about with search and research and everything. But you don't know, and you really know the truth is there at home. But you are searching under the street light. Because we, we don't like that gloomy climate. Even the truth is there. We find where the glittering light is there. Well, the, the, the sacrifice your body and the life. That's the only thing we have at last to sacrifice. When the meditation happens, you are running a risk. Of course, that time you start sweating and giddiness and the lausitic and all the kind of thing. Once you've gone through, you are no more the same person. It is like a shedding off of your old skin. Reptiles usually when they are growing, they shed off their old skin and developing another skin like, so that is, there's one simile, the sutta in the sutta nipata, um, shedding off of your old skin, uraga sutta. Are you ready to shed off? <laughs> I hope one day it will happen. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you for taking our questions and your wisdom sharing. Um, ah, yesterday was a very exhausting day. Um, there were a lot of distractions um, and it was hard to concentrate in the morning. So it took double the effort to, to be mindful the whole morning. So in the afternoon, I was so exhausted. My body was worn out. Um, and I could not just sit still and concentrate. Um, my mind was peaceful, but because the body could not sit still, I could not concentrate. I could not focus. So I just accepted the tiredness. It says, you know, I'm tired. I cannot even close my eyes, and I'm just going to sit here and with my eyes open, watching you. Um, so at some point, um, I, I, I was just listening to my breath. And then there was a mosquito or a little insect zooming around. And then I just became the mosquito. <laughs> it just like went there and followed. My mind just followed the insect wherever it went. And then it came back and zzz. Now, all this with my eyes open. Um, so I have, the question is, can you reach levels of concentration of any depth with your eyes open? That's one. Two, at times when you're so exhausted, is it better to just go and sleep and rest or make more effort to concentrate? So if and I is if that, I am to go into if I am going to stay concentration is tahana uh, vachana magadigani tabu how you how do you formulate your question you can't use the term concentration you have to raise the question no because we are not here for the concentration we are for mindfulness right so, so without using the term concentration how can you formulate the question. So I became mindful of the buzzing. So then I will ask, you are very calm and quiet state and with your disturbed state, which one is more closer to the first truth of suffering? Which, uh, which one was more closer to the... Truth of suffering. Uh, there was no suffering. 
So there is a, you say, exhausted. And I was exhausted. I knew I was exhausted, but I didn't have any feelings about it. I, I wasn't, I just knew the body was worn out, but I had no, I, that's, that's the thing. I did not experience any aversion or nothing. I just accepted it. So if, if that is the case, that is the maturity of your meditation, your equipoise mind, where the mind is very calm, concerned, the, even the taboo I am using, the concentrated and quiet, or whether it is agitated or exhausted and worn out, still you keep on practicing. So that's the maturity. And when and where you are still exhausted and uh, no much of enthusiasm, and that is the time more you are more close to the truth. You are more close to the reality. Because mind is not in a soothing situation. It's utterly open. You are utterly here and now. And that is what so accepting it or appreciating it is completely different thing. If you do not appreciate, it appears like a torturing, it appears like a negative. But you can understand, I am undergoing this kind of a, a un comfortable situation, not for a gain, not for a fame, nothing, but to understand the truth as it is. And beginner cannot do it. You have to have that kind of a maturity. And still this is not the end. This is also halfway. So this is the way we are facing. We are meeting, met up with the, the reality of the life. So if you can continue, don't expect it to happen, don't chase behind it. When and where it is happening, you can be face to face it. That is what we call that equipoise mind, unwavering mind, and see things as they are without any choice. Choice. So, uh, for a normal meditative life, they expect everything to be very calm and co uh, facilitating and kind of thing. But the real Vipassana is taking place whenever you are faced, met up with a challenge, exhausted situation. If you are not giving up and still just try one split second more, one split second more, that's the key. That's the way we are advancing in our understanding the, the human life or truth of suffering. So day by day you develop immunity, day by day you develop the tolerance and it is very, very relative. You can feel day by day how much you can meet up with and still no complaint. You never expect any kind of alterations. Just face it. And then you become more adaptable, or malleable to any situation. Rather than expecting external facilities, you I don't know whether the term is good, capacitization of your mind. Mind make it ready for this kind of thing. So may the tomorrow come again and again to you. That exhausted situation, that is a blessing. <laughs> Thank you, Bante. So you are taking too much of photos. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now it's uh, almost time up. So we are going to take about one hour for walking meditation and going to meet here again at four o'clock for common sitting. With that announcement, we are going to wind up our question and answer session. Thank you very much for the participation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.